The subject of today's session is the beginning of the fourth book of the Torah, the book of Numbers. And of course, as the name of the book implies, it has a lot about counting. Truth is, this is an apt reflection of the ancient Hebrew name of the fourth book of the Torah as well. In Hebrew, Chumash Pekudim, which means the book of counting, the book of numbers. There are a number of counts in this book of the Torah, and I hope we'll be able to touch on all of them in the time that we have in today's session. Of course, I'd like to start with the first, which is at the very beginning of the book of numbers. We read, starting from the first verse, and God spoke unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they would come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take you the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel. We'll note, and we will return to this point, that what is rendered in our translation as take you the sum is in the Hebrew, se'u et rosh, which literally means lift up the head. So again, we're going to return to that nuance a little bit later. For now, let's leave it as take you the sum, because it does refer to the count. So take you the sum of all the congregation of the people of Israel by their families, by their father's houses, according to the number of names, every male by their poles, from 20 years old and upward. So, of course, inevitably, one question that we can't help but confront already right now is, why is the count limited only to the men? And, for that matter, why does it only begin from age 20 and up? And the simple answer to this question, of course, emerges from the very next words in verse 3. All that are able to go forth to war in Israel, you shall number them by their hosts, even you and Aaron. That is, when we consider what the purpose of this count was, it was to count all that are able to go forth to war in Israel. And in an era in which war basically amounted to hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the one who had the upper hand was the one who had the greater physical prowess, war was admittedly a test of physical strength, and it was generally a man's business. Not only specifically a man's business, but specifically the business of men from age 20 and up who are regarded as having reached their physical prime and have the wherewithal to be able to wage battle in this manner. So that, of course, is the direct purpose of this count. And we read further of the mechanism that with you there shall be a man of every tribe to assist you in the counting. And then in verse 17, we read, Moses and Aaron took these men who are listed by name, these men that are specified, named, appointed by name, and they assemble the entire congregation. And in verse 19, we read, as God commanded Moses, so did he number them in the wilderness of Sinai. And we then read the results of the count. Now, we already addressed the easy question, why is the count specifically of men age 20 and up? But of course, inevitably, we also need to confront the hard question. The hard question that provides the title for this session, counting the people for whom and for what? Now, just to clarify what I mean by the question, Let's note at the outset 
the obvious part of the answer. That is, for whom are we not counting? This should be obvious to us all. We are not counting for God. God, obviously, doesn't need us to do a census in order for him to know the numbers. So obviously, by process of elimination, since we aren't counting for God, we must necessarily be counting for us. Which, of course, inevitably leads us to ask, what is the role, the value, the significance, the purpose of our doing this? And before we attempt to answer this question, let's just amplify it a bit further by recognizing that counting doesn't only seem to be unnecessary. It actually can even be dangerous. This clearly emerges in Exodus chapter 30, where we read about the subject of conducting a census time in the Torah. Chapter 30, verse 11, God spoke unto Moses, saying, when you take the sum, and again, literally, that is when you lift up the head of the people of Israel, according to their number, then shall they give every man an atonement for his soul unto God, when you number them, an atonement. Now, obviously, needing to give an atonement implies there's something for which you need to atone. Something in conducting a census that demands atonement. And if that weren't frightening enough, the continuation of the verse is downright terrifying. That there be no plague among them when you number them. Conducting a census can, we are told here, lead to a plague. We'll see an example of that very graphically shortly. And so, with this realization that conducting a census requires atonement and can lead to a plague, inevitably, we need to consider why conduct any kind of count at all? Let's consider what indeed is described in Exodus chapter 30. What kind of count we're discussing here. We read with respect to this count in Exodus chapter 30, Verse 13, this they shall give, everyone that passes among them that are numbered, half a shekel, after the shekel of the sanctuary, the, sec the shekel is 20 geras, half a shekel for an offering to God. This is the atonement money. And if we ask what becomes of the money that's collected, uh, the answer to that, we read in Exodus chapter 38, beginning in verse 25. And the silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was a hundred talents and a thousand seven hundred and three score and fifteen shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. What was the purpose of this collection? Well, that becomes clear in verse 27. And the hundred talents of silver were for casting the sockets of the sanctuary and the sockets of the veil. What sockets? Obviously, we don't mean electrical sockets. Rather, the vertical beams of the walls of the sanctuary had at their bottoms two arms that would be stuck into silver casements, those are the sockets, in order to keep them standing upright. Well, there are 20 beams on the north and south sides of the tabernacle. There are eight on 
the West. That means a total of 48 beams. Each beam has two sockets into which the two arms of the beam are placed. 48 times 2, 96. And then there are another four pillars, not the ones at the entrance of the tabernacle, but rather the ones that stand as a separation between the holy area of the tabernacle and the holy of holies. These four pillars take one socket apiece. So, of course, 96 plus four for the four pillars equals 100. And so the 100 talents of silver were for the casting of the sockets of the sanctuary and the sockets of the veil, 100 sockets for 100 talents, a talent for a socket. And then the loose change, the rest of the silver, were used for various adornments and purposes that pertained to the other silver that appears in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle, and in the surrounding courtyard. So, of course, on the most basic plane, if we ask, why count, especially when it can be dangerous, when it can lead to a plague, when it requires atonement? The most basic answer is, this is not counting for nothing. That is, counting without purpose is bad. But this had a very clear purpose. You couldn't build the tabernacle without these sockets. The purpose of the census was not the count, but the construction, the construction of the tabernacle as God commanded. Of course, with this borne in mind, when we return to our count at the beginning of the book of Numbers, all once again, as indeed we already noted, the purpose is also very clear. Again, in Numbers chapter 1, verse 3, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel. With, of course, the realization that at this juncture, remember, this is before the sin of the spies that resulted in 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. We'll return to that a little bit later. At this stage, the nation is poised to go straight into the promised land. Well, they're going to need an army. And to that extent, the census is not merely counting for no reason. It's counting in order to establish an army. And this inevitably leads to a deeper consideration of what the purpose of the census, what any of these counts is. Because, of course, inevitably, as we already noted, God doesn't need the census in order to know how many there are. God doesn't. We do. But then, why do we? Can't God just tell us? That is, why is there a need for a census in order to prepare for entry into land when, after all, God could just tell Moses what the number is without the need to conduct the census. And of course, inevitably, our answer to this question, however trite, is, well, God doesn't work that way. And we should stress here, God not working this way is the greatest gift that God gives us as human beings. Because after all, if God did work that way, if God did give us all the answers, if God did take care of everything for us by means of direct divine intervention, that would be tantamount to treating us as a bunch of immature, irresponsible children. Now, truth is that at times, human beings do behave like immature, irresponsible children, even when biologically they're already adults, but that's their choice. 
the greatest gift God gives us is the ability to take responsibility. The ability, as it were, to become his junior partners. Of course, inevitably, we should appreciate here, we can't answer the question of why that's the way God created the world. Ultimately, as we read in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says God. We're not explaining why this is the world that God created. We are, however, noting that this is indeed the world that God created, that God gave us. Maybe a good illustration, one admittedly among very many, is perhaps, arguably, the first overtly spiritual act that God does in the world in creation is what we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. He made it holy. And yet, surprisingly enough, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, in the Decalogue, God gives us a commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to hallow it, to sanctify it. I can't help but note here, the translation to keep it holy is simply wrong. The Hebrew, which is lekadisho, means to make it holy, which of course inevitably raises the question, why do we need to make it holy? Didn't God already do that? And lest we might have forgotten about Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, that's fine enough because God explicitly reminds us. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 10, God blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So God already sanctified the Sabbath. But still, again, the greatest gift, God invites us to be his junior partners. And even though God already hallowed the Sabbath, he bids us to hallow it, to sanctify it. And so too, with everything else in our lives. Now, when we consider Numbers chapter 1, that census that is to find out how many men there are who are able to wage war, we recognize likewise. The waging of that war is for a purpose. War is never pleasant. But simultaneously, the world has a judge. And as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4, God warns us, speak not in your heart after that God your Lord has pushed them, the indigenous nations, out from before you, saying, for my righteousness, God has brought me in to possess the land. Not so. Whereas for the wickedness of these nations, God does drive them out before you. And likewise, again, in the following verse, but for the wickedness of these nations, God your Lord does drive them out from before you. Now, once again, the manner in which these verses express what happens is God is the one who's driving them out. But God, of course, could drive them out and leave you as mere bystanders, spectators, irrelevant in the dispensing of divine justice. And he didn't. He gave you a job to play. You are the means through which this divine judgment, the well-earned punishment of these nations, is to be meted out. And inevitably then, because God isn't treating you like a bunch of immature, irresponsible children, you need to get to work. You need to establish an army and figure out how many people there are to fill the various roles that need to be filled in the army. So this count, then, is for you, and it's not unnecessary. It is to enable you to discharge the responsibility that God is giving you. It's also for an additional purpose, and that additional purpose becomes clear in Numbers chapter 2, 
immediately in the wake of the initial figures of the census, we read in chapter 2, And God spoke unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, The children of Israel shall encamp by their father's houses, every man with his own standard according to the ensigns, a good way off shall they encamp round about the tent of meeting. And what follows then is a very detailed presentation, together with the numbers from the census that was just conducted, that on the east side of the encampment is the standard of the camp of Judah, and the other two tribes that are together with Judah on the east side of the tabernacle. On the south side is the standard of Reuben, and the other two tribes that are with Reuben on the south side. On the west side is the standard of the camp of Ephraim, and the two tribes that are with Ephraim. And on the north side, finally, the standard of the camp of Dan, and the two tribes that are with him. The 12 tribes are distributed round about the tabernacle, and in order to be able to structure the encampment as God commands, of course, inevitably, you need to have the numbers. And the numbers are indeed cited again. We didn't include them here because of space limitations. But there's also a purpose in this count, and it is indeed in fulfillment of God's command, as we read in Numbers chapter 2, verse 34, thus did the children of Israel, according to all that God commanded Moses, so they encamped by their standards, and so they set forward each one according to its families and according to its father's houses. Again, a purpose. And we'll already note here that when we get to the next count in the book of Numbers, in Numbers chapter 26, we see, likewise, the purpose is very explicitly stated. Reading from chapter 26, verse 2, take the sum, once again, literally lift up the head of all the congregation of the people of Israel from 20 years old and upward by their father's houses. What's the purpose? Once again, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel. That is, in Numbers chapter 26, we are after the sin of the spies and after the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness that were the punishment for the sin of the spies. And now the nation really is ready to enter the promised land. And again, there's a need for an army. God could provide the count as a miracle. But once again, we realize God doesn't work that way. And so the census has a purpose to know all that are able to go forth to war in Israel. That's one purpose in this count. There is admittedly another as well, and this emerges in the continuation of the chapter from verse 52 and on. And God spoke unto Moses, saying, Unto these, the consequence of the census, the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of names. To the more, you shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer, you shall give the less inheritance to each one according to those that were numbered of it shall its inheritance be given. That is, inasmuch as the nation is poised to enter the promised land and the land will be apportioned among the tribes and among the families of the nation, once again, there is a purpose in this count because that apportionment of the land could be done by divine miracle. There is undoubtedly a divine source for what will take place. That is, we do read in verse 55, notwithstanding the land shall be divided by lot. And when the lots are drawn, obviously, inevitably, we recognize who stands behind the lots. 
that is, after all, God. But still, God, so to speak, is behind the scenes. The intervention is not explicit. What is explicit is the empowerment. You are God's junior partners. You conduct the census. You apportion the land accordingly. So once again, the theme that we keep on encountering here is the count is permissible. Indeed, it is commanded when there is an important purpose that it plays. But the warning in Exodus chapter 30 remains in force. If the count doesn't have a purpose, it can be disastrous. And that brings us to the tragic story that we read in both the last chapter of the book of Samuel, second book of Samuel, chapter 24, and the first book of Chronicles, chapter 21. We have the version in Chronicles here in the sources before us. The version at the end of the book of Samuel is indeed very similar. The consequences of a census that did not have any constructive purpose. In Chronicles 1, chapter 21, beginning in verse 2, And David said to Joab and to the princes of the people, Go, number Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring me word that I may know the sum of them. Any reason? Nothing stated here. And indeed, in verse 3, Joab said, May God make his people a hundred times so many more as they are. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why does my lord request this thing? Why will he be a cause of guilt unto Israel? A very ominous note, undoubtedly resonating with what God already warned in the Torah in Exodus chapter 30. Verse 4, nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab, whereas Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Verse 5, and Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people unto David. Now, we read here that what he counted was men who draw the sword. So, once again, the count was of potentially military men, but unlike the counts that we saw in Numbers chapter 1 and chapter 26, where there was a clear present need to conscript the men for an army, there wasn't any obvious need here. And perhaps further as a reflection of that, we read in verse 6, but Levi and Benjamin, he, Yoab, did not number among them, for the king's word was abominable to Yoab. And nonetheless, in verse 7, God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. And in context, it's very clear that God wasn't displeased with Yoab's failure to count the tribes of Levi and Benjamin. On the contrary, he was displeased with committing a census in the first place. And David realizes his blunder. In verse 8, David said unto God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now put away, I beseech you, the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Words well spoken too late. And so we read in the continuation of the chapter that God sends Gad, David's seer, to say to him, verse 10, I offer you three things. Choose you one of them that I may do it unto you. We read the list in verse 12 and they are all dire. Either three years of famine or three months 
to be swept away before your foes while the sword of your enemies overtakes you. Or else three days the sword of God, even pestilence in the land, and the angel of God destroying throughout all the borders of Israel. Now, therefore, see what answer I shall return to him who sent me. And David said unto God, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of God, for very great are his mercies, and let me not fall into the hand of man. Falling into the hand of God is the pestilence. Verse 14. So God sent the pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. Now, whether what is described here, and again at the end of the book of Samuel as well, is a failure to count the people by means of the half shekel silver coins, or simply a failure to have any good purpose for conducting a census in the first place, is admittedly not explicit in the text. But we certainly see what can result when a census is conducted when or in a manner in which it shouldn't be. That doesn't mean that conducting a census is lethal. But conducting a census when you shouldn't is lethal. That distinction is of critical importance for us. And it's also a point that is really driven home when one considers what we read just two chapters later in the book of Chronicles, in the first book of Chronicles, chapter 23, where we read, beginning in verse 2, that David gathered together all the princes of Israel with the priests and the Levites, and the Levites were numbered from 30 years old and upward. And their number by their poles, man by man, was 38,000. Numbered? King David, didn't you learn from what took place in chapter 21? But of course, inevitably, the answer is, chapter 21 was a problem because there was no good purpose. Here, there is. As we read in verse 4, of these, 24,000 were to oversee the work of the house of God, and 6,000 were officers and judges, and 4,000 were doorkeepers, and 4,000 praised God with the instruments which I made to praise therewith. And David divided them into courses according to the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kehat, and Merari. So, this wasn't conducting a census for nothing. There was a clear purpose that pertained to the temple service that this census was to fulfill. And indeed, there's no indication at all that any harm resulted from this census. The problem was the other one. When we consider why a needless, purposeless census is so destructive, there's yet an additional passage in Chronicles that is undoubtedly a crucial key. And this pertains, once again, to that census that was conducted in chapter 21 that shouldn't have been. We read in the first book of Chronicles in chapter 27, in verses 23 and 24, David took not the number of them from 20 years old and under. Because God had said he would increase Israel like the stars of heaven. Yoab, the son of Tzuriah, began to number, but finished not. We saw that. He didn't count the tribes of Benjamin and Levi. And nonetheless, there came wrath for this upon Israel, that there was any count at all. Neither was the number put into the account in the Chronicles of King David, because it should have never been done. Now, what is so key here in verse 23, that God had said he would increase Israel like to the stars of heaven? 
the expression is at least somewhat similar to what we read in the prophecy of Hosea in chapter 2, verse 1. Admittedly, with a different metaphor, but yet the number of the people of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that instead of that which was said unto them, you are not my people, it shall be said unto them, you are the children of the living God. This is the blessing. The blessing of specifically not being measured nor numbered. It seems very similar to the expression that we encountered back in the first book of Chronicles in chapter 27. Because God had said he would increase Israel like the stars of heaven. The blessing of God. The blessing of God that not only doesn't depend upon counting, but on the contrary, may actually depend on not counting. Why? Well, part of the answer we can readily glean from the principle that we already noted. God doesn't operate through overt, explicit, in-your-face divine intervention. Except for extraordinary circumstances, God deliberately remains behind the scenes. Why? To empower us, to treat us like grown-ups, not like the immature, irresponsible children. And therefore, while God bestows his blessings, he bestows those blessings from behind the scenes. We have a saying in our tradition that the blessing is to be found in that which is hidden from the eyes. Because the moment that everything is visible, everything is known, the count has already been made, then the blessing would entail an overt act of divine intervention. And again, for the most part, God doesn't operate that way. So the blessing is manifest specifically through our not counting, which inevitably raises the question, why? I think we could already appreciate that that question, why, brings us back to the critical issue that we haven't really addressed yet. And that is, while well, we saw in Exodus chapter 30, that conducting a census can lead to a plague. And we saw in the second book of Samuel, chapter 24, and the first book of Chronicles, chapter 21, that a census improperly conducted actually did lead to a plague. We still need to ask the question, why? What's so dangerous, potentially even deadly, in conducting a census? And here, inevitably, we need to consider what the alternative is to that hiddenness of not counting. When you count, whatever it is that you are counting, whoever it is you are counting, necessarily stands out. It counts. It is significant. It is important. It's not merely part of the background. And when you stand out, you can be endangering yourself. Take a simple illustration. If you're standing in a wide open field and there's a lightning storm, and you're the only thing standing up in that wide open field, you're attracting the lightning. The fact that you stand out is precisely what is endangering you. Maybe to take an illustration more directly from scripture to illustrate this point, recall the story of the Shunammite woman 
about whom we read in the second book of Kings, in chapter 4. Beginning in verse 8, it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread, and so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat bread. That is, Elisha does the rounds in the nation to judge, to teach, to instruct. And every time he would come to Shunem, he would be the beneficiary of this woman's hospitality. So at some point, as we read in verse 9, she said to her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God who passes by us continually. Let us make, I pray you, a little chamber on the roof, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he comes to us that he shall turn in there. And that's what happened. It fell on a day that he came there and he turned into the upper chamber and he lay there, he rested there. And of course, predictably, Elisha wants to express his gratitude for this lavish display of hospitality. So he has his servant Gehazi call the Shunammite woman and has him say to her, Behold, you have been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for you? How can we pay you back? Would you be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And I have to admit that it's not clear from the text whether Elisha is referring to the king, the king of Israel, and the captain of the host, the captain of his host, or the king, the king of kings, God, and the captain of his host, Obviously, Elisha had a very powerful, even intimate bond with each of these kings. So, can I intercede on your behalf? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. What a profound response. She knows Elisha can secure for her special privileges, special advantages, and she's not interested. Because the moment I get anything special, I'm standing out. The moment I stand out, I'm like the person standing up in the open field during the lightning storm. I dwell among my own people. I don't want to stand out. Now let's consider what that means in a more global sense. At the end of the story of creation, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, we read, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God seeing, as we have noted in the past, means God is not only aware, but he evaluates. Behold, it was very good. God is always judging the world. God is always judging everyone in the world. And that, admittedly, is scary. Because as we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, there is not a righteous man upon earth who does good and doesn't sin. So, in this state of affairs, the world has a judge, and that judge is always judging. How are we going to survive? And of course, ultimately, the answer is, there is that divine justice, but God is patient, and long-suffering. That doesn't mean justice is simply foregone. Divine justice is never foregone. That becomes very clear repeatedly in Scripture. Ultimately, there is the payback. Payback.
for whatever we have done. So that's what happens eventually in God's great patience with us. For the most part, the judgment terminates in what we would describe in modern language as a suspended sentence, meaning not acquittal. Again, there is a judge and there is payback for everything. But the payback is postponed. It is suspended. The judgment is not executed instantly. That is how we survive. That is all inevitably on the one hand. On the other hand, there are circumstances that can, as it were, force divine judgment to be executed. If a person storms into court and says, here I am, I want to be judged, we might consider such an individual foolish, but the consequence can indeed be judgment. Anytime a person does anything that makes him or her stand out, stand up, and be counted, that can incur judgment. And the suspended sentence is no longer suspended. And justice may be done. That, inevitably, is why conducting a census can be so dangerous. Because, again, the moment someone is being counted, he counts. The moment all the attention is on you, who you are, you become significant. It's tantamount to storming into court and saying, here I am, judge me. And the judgment at that point may be immediate and irrevocable and it can even lead to a plague. So what, first of all, do we appreciate is the antidote to that specter of divine justice being meted out categorically and instantly? Well, once again, we return to Exodus chapter 30. Remember that God warned us in Exodus chapter 30, in verse 12, that when the count is done, every man shall give an atonement for his soul unto God. What exactly is this atonement? We saw this. It is, as we read in verse 13, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. What's the significance of half a shekel? Perhaps we may suggest here, the significance of half a shekel is it's nothing whole. It's only part of a whole. At that moment, when you stand out from the background, when you become significant as an individual, you immediately join yourself together with someone else. The whole shekel only happens through your being conjoined with another. You're not standing only by yourself. And that's critical. That can even be critical to your survival. Because at that moment then, you aren't placing yourself in opposition to the rest of the community. You're together with someone else. You're part of the community. And indeed, maybe in much the same vein, we can stress in verse 15, the rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel when they give the offering of God to make atonement for your souls. Exactly the same amount. Because once there's going to be any kind of individuation, different people giving different amounts, again, you're standing out. You're not part of the community. But the whole idea here is to become part of the community. So... Everyone gives exactly the same thing. We'll note furthermore here that 
the expression that keeps on appearing here is atonement. What does atonement mean? What does it signify with respect to the antidote to the potentially disastrous consequences of conducting a census? In the Hebrew, what is rendered here as atonement is kofel. Likewise, the verb to make atonement, lechaper. The root of this word, kofel, lechaper, kapar, means to cover over. In the same vein, the ark cover from the same root is called the kaporet. There are many instances of this root appearing in this sense in scripture. The point that we're emphasizing here is the atonement amounts to a kind of protective shield covering over and preventing that dire scenario, you being the only one standing up in the open field and attracting the lightning. And maybe part of the same theme is that, as we already noted, we read in Exodus chapter 38, that what becomes of this atonement offering that people are to give, the hundred talents of silver were for casting the sockets of the sanctuary and the sockets of the veil. That is, the foundation upon which the tabernacle stands, where everyone is joined together. First of all, all those half shekels combine to full shekels. And then all of the individual shekels combine into a talent of silver. And these talents of silver combine to a hundred talents that stand all together on the floor of the tabernacle upon which the entire tabernacle is built. In other words, again, you don't stand as an individual by yourself. You stand together with everyone. You stand as part of that greater whole. The protection against the dire consequences of the census is to be part of that greater whole where everyone comes together. That stated, we should note simultaneously that that is inevitably one side of the story, one part of this picture. And here we need to consider, once again, the literal meaning of the Hebrew phrase that is rendered repeatedly as take you the sum. We noted this already, but now it's time for a little bit of a Hebrew lesson. Again, in the Hebrew, it is se'u et rosh, literally lift up the head. So it's lift up the head in Numbers chapter 1, verse 2. It is in the same expression, lift up the head in Exodus chapter 30, verse 12. It's also lift up the head in Numbers chapter 26, that second count, verse 2, as well. What's the meaning of lift up the head? Indeed we recognize that the other side of this coin, while we're not counting needlessly, and there is indeed this atonement, this covering over of the half shekel in order to keep you as part of the greater whole, so you don't merely stand out and away from everyone. The other side of that is, given in a census, you do need to become significant. That's the whole purpose of counting. And inevitably, we appreciate that tension is a tension that exists throughout our lives. Because while we appreciate, on the one hand, the danger of standing up, standing out, not as part of the community, we also recognize that there is another kind of danger in merely being part of a herd, part of a group without any individual identity whatsoever.
the command that God gives Moses in Numbers chapter 1, verse 2, and in Numbers chapter 26, verse 2, to lift up the head is to make everyone count, not to merely be part of that greater whole and amorphous, indistinguishable member of a herd, but to count as an individual. That is an extraordinary opportunity. Of course, inevitably, as we have noted on many occasions, any time God gives us an opportunity, it instantly becomes a responsibility, and it can go both ways. With respect to this expression, lift up the head, there is an earlier context in which we encounter it in Genesis chapter 40. But in Genesis chapter 40, the expression, which is identical in the Hebrew, lift up the head, doesn't mean take the sum. It means literally lift up the head. The context is when Joseph, in prison, hears the dreams of the chief butler and chief baker of Pharaoh. Now, we won't go through the dreams in detail. I'm sure you remember them very well. What's relevant for our purposes is that after Joseph hears the dream of the chief butler, he tells him in Genesis chapter 40, verse 13, within yet three days shall Pharaoh lift up your head. He'll treat you with significance and restore you to your office. And you shall give Pharaoh's cup into his hand like the former manner when you were his butler. Well, after hearing such a great report of the interpretation of the butler's dream, the chief baker describes his dream to Joseph, and the interpretation for him is significantly different. And yet, ironically, it starts almost exactly the same way. Within yet three days shall Pharaoh lift up your head. Now, this is not merely a similarity that is an artifact of the translation. In the Hebrew, the expressions here, Yisa faro et roshecha, Yisa faro et roshecha, are identical. So for the baker too, Pharaoh will lift up your head. The only thing is that in the case of the baker, Pharaoh will lift up your head from off of you. That is, he'll hang you on a tree. Still lifting up the head. Not simply in the physical sense of removing your head. But he's going to focus upon you. Focus upon you as an individual. With all of the attendant opportunity and responsibility that that means. And that's what we read in the conclusion of the story. In verse 20, And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He lifted up the head. He treated them with significance. But what that significance was varied greatly. And he restored the chief butler back unto his butlership, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Opportunity and responsibility. Two sides of the same coin. Is being counted something dangerous? Inevitably, it depends. Is being given responsibility dangerous? Not in and of itself. But if one doesn't shoulder that responsibility, that's dangerous. When you stand out, when you are given that responsibility, if you don't shoulder it, if you are derelict 
that can be deadly. It's not the responsibility that's deadly. It's how we deal with it. And indeed, in that vein, we might note that we find, again, almost exactly the same expression in another couple of passages in Scripture. I think it's noteworthy to consider them. In Psalm 83, we read in verse 3, For lo, your enemies, God, are in an uproar, and they that hate you have lifted up the head. Same expression in the Hebrew. Nase'u rosh. They lift up the head. They stand out. But they're standing out not in order to shoulder responsibility in a positive manner. They're standing out because they want to have impact. They want to have impact in ruining. They want to have impact in destroying. They want to have impact because they aren't immature, irresponsible children. In this instance, they are deliberately acting evil adults. They have lifted up the head. And indeed, when we consider the consequences of being counted, of standing out, when one does not behave in the responsible manner that God bids us, of course, the results are ruinous. Even though the census that we read in chapter 1 of the book of Numbers is not only legitimate, but a divine command for those who don't shoulder the responsibility. In particular, remember, the census was to prepare for entry into the land. The ones who sinned in the sin of the spies, who didn't want to go into the land, received their punishment. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 29, we read that punishment is your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. Whose carcasses? All that were numbered of you, according to your whole number. That is, specifically, the ones who count, the ones who are significant, and who, while vested with that significance, did not shoulder the responsibility that standing out imposes. They're the ones who will perish in the wilderness. It's not the census that kills, because after all, in the next verse we read, save Caleb, the son of Yefunah, and Joshua, the son of Nun. They were counted. They won't die, because they, when confronted with responsibility, shouldered the responsibility. They stood with God. They stood out, and they were saved. It's not the census that kills. It's their election of responsibility that kills. Indeed, in much the same vein, when we consider that second census in the book of Numbers, in Numbers chapter 26, we read, these are they that were numbered by Moses and El Azar, the priest, who numbered the people of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. But among them, there was not a man of them who were numbered by Moses and Aaron the priest, who numbered the people of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. Why? Because God had said of them, of them who were numbered, they shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not left a man of them, save Caleb, the son of Yifuneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. They were left. Because again, it's not the census that kills. It's sin that kills. And uh, one additional instance in which we find that expression of the lifting up of the head brings us back to the first book of Chronicles, now in chapter 29, and David blessing God before all the congregation. Beginning in verse 10, David said, Blessed be you, O God, God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O God, is the greatness and the might and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O God. And then we have one final phrase. 
And this final phrase, once again, speaks of the lifting up of the head in the Hebrew. Now, the translation here renders it, and you are exalted as head above all. But an alternative translation that I think is much more literal, and in this instance, I think much more correct, is yours is the lifting up of every head. Meaning, whenever someone's head is lifted up, whenever someone becomes significant, it's from you, God. I have to admit that I have a preference for this second translation. Because when you consider the following verse, verse 12, both riches and honors come of you, and you rule over all and in your hand is power and might and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all exactly everything comes from god everything comes from god including the lifting up of every head that also comes from god that is the opportunity the opportunity that generates the responsibility the responsibility that necessarily we choose whether to shoulder or not. God gives us the opportunity to be significant. And that, after all, is the greatest gift. As we read in Psalm 8, verses 5 and 6, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you think of him? Yet, you have made him but little lower than the divine, and have crowned him with honor and splendor. You bestow upon man this greatness. Yours is the bestowal of the lifting up of the head for everyone. Because again, while standing up and standing out and standing apart from everyone else is dangerous, can be deadly. The alternative extreme of merely being part of an anonymous herd is not the solution. We need to find the right way to stand up, to have our head lifted up. And it all amounts to how we relate to the responsibilities that God gives us. It is in this vein that I think it is instructive for us to consider one additional motif that pertains to the second count that we encounter in the book of Numbers. We already saw, after all, in Exodus chapter 30 and in graphic description in the second book of Samuel chapter 24 and the first book of Chronicles chapter 21, that a census improperly conducted can lead to a plague. Ironically, it seems that in Numbers chapter 26, a plague led to a census. Because in verse 1 we read, and it came to pass after the plague. And then in verse 2, take the sum or lift up the head of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upward. Why is there this stress that it came to pass after the plague that the census is to be conducted? And I think this too pertains to our appreciating what it means to find the balance between these two extremes in the tension of, on the one hand, we're not standing up and apart from the community, but on the other hand, we are significant as individuals. What happens in a plague? We read in Numbers chapter 25 of the circumstances that led to this plague, to which reference is made at the beginning of chapter 26. In chapter 25, beginning in verse 1, Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself 
unto the Baal of Peor, and the anger of God was kindled against Israel. And by the time we get to the end of this narrative in verse 9, and those that died by the plague were 24,000. Now, inevitably, when you live through such a colossal devastation, life can become very cheap. 24,000 just wiped away. And you can be left wondering, what's it all worth? What's the significance of life? What's the significance of my life? Nothing matters. But you do matter. Never should you think that the conclusion to be reached is you're simply an anonymous, meaningless member of a herd and that you don't count. And so the purpose of the census is to drive home. You do count. Stand up and be counted. And the census is not what kills. Because indeed, as we read precisely in this context, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Verses 3 and 4. Your eyes have seen what God did in Baal Peor. For all the men that followed the Baal of Peor, God your Lord has destroyed from the midst of you. But you who did cleave unto God your Lord are alive. Every one of you this day. You count. You're significant. You need to be significant. You need to be important. So when we consider on the one hand the realization that censuses are dangerous. They can even be deadly if they are unjustified, if they are unnecessary. The danger that inheres in the census is when people, for no good reason, just stand up to be counted. When people, for no good reason, separate themselves from the community. But simultaneously, to find out how you need to stand up and be counted. How you need to be significant in the community. Because you are. That's critical. So they ask, why bother having a census altogether? Not just because there are responsibilities that God gives us to shoulder. Because we are responsible adults and not immature, irresponsible children. But also because as responsible adults, you need to stand up and be counted. You need to be significant. When there's a plague in Numbers chapter 25, there needs to be that second counting in chapter 26 to drive home that you do count, that you are important, and you need to stand up and be counted. And that brings us, lastly, to the third count that we encounter in the book of Numbers. And that is in Numbers chapter 31. After the war against Midian, we read, and once again, it's the self-same expression of lifting up the head, that the officers in the battle come and say to Moses, in Numbers chapter 31 from verse 49, your servants have taken the sum, again, literally lifted up the head, of the men of war that are under our charge, and they lack not one man of us. Now, this is amazing. Not only was there no plague, but in going out to war, where in a situation of such danger, it's almost inevitable that even if you're on the winning side, there are casualties. Not one man is missing. Because when you go out to war, indeed, there is the count. A thousand men from each of the tribes go out to war against Midian. Every individual counts in battle. You do your unique job as part of that fighting force. You count in the positive sense. And as a result, when you count that way, 
you can even be the beneficiary of this extraordinary miracle that sometimes when you stand up to be counted, that enables you to be the receiver of God's blessings on an extraordinary plane. No one is missing. But there's an additional dimension here in this count, and that is what we read from verse 50 and on. And we have brought God's offering, what every man has gotten of jewels of gold, the armlets and bracelets, signet rings, earrings, girdles, to make atonement for our souls before God. And Moses and Eleazar, the priest, took the gold of them, even all wrought jewels. They took the gold of the captains of thousands and hundreds and brought it into the tent of meeting for a memorial for the people of Israel before God. And that brings us to one crucial and final theme in this story. And that is, what's the ideal solution for ensuring that when you stand up to be counted, that that makes you into a channel to receive God's blessings, as opposed to the one who gets struck by lightning. It all has to do with the tabernacle, the holy temple. The atonement being brought to the temple, to the tabernacle in the case of Numbers chapter 31, and of course, inevitably, you'll recall, likewise, in Exodus chapter 30, the atonement brought to the tabernacle for the hundred sockets of the beams and the pillars of the tabernacle. And for that matter, getting back to Numbers chapter 1, remember one of the purposes of the census was to array the people, as we read in Numbers chapter 2, for the way they will encamp round about the tabernacle. Why is the tabernacle so significant to all of this? Because the tabernacle, after all, is that end goal toward which the people are all going to be oriented and oriented together. It's you stand out, but you stand out not against, not as apart from the people. You stand out as the channel to bring the blessing to the entire nation and to the entire world. And indeed, it is in that vein that we should turn one last time to the terrifying story that we saw in the first book of Chronicles, chapter 21, regarding the count, the disastrous count that King David had unwittingly brought as a destruction upon his people. In verse 15, God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. Terrifying. And as he was about to destroy, God beheld and he repented of the evil and said to the destroying angel, it is enough, now stay your hand. And the angel of God was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And we read in verse 16, David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of God standing between the earth and heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. And David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And the plague is stayed. And in verse 18, the angel of God commanded Gad, David's seer, to say to David that David should go up and rear an altar unto God in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, where the plague was stayed. And so David does. He purchases the place of the threshing floor and builds upon it an altar to God. We read in verse 26, and David built there an altar unto God and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon God. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of the burnt offering. 
But that's not the end of the story. As we read a few verses later, at the beginning of chapter 22, then David said, this is the house of God. This is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. What is that place? The threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. That, of course, is none other than Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, where the Holy Temple is built. That is, while the census should never have been done, the census was one of King David's worst mistakes. And it led to this disastrous plague. Simultaneously, what eventually becomes the healing, the atonement, once again, like in Exodus chapter 30, like in Numbers chapter 31, the atonement offering, the atonement is, all this guides us to the tabernacle, ultimately, the holy temple in Jerusalem. Because ultimately, you stand out, but you stand out as part of everyone who comes there to the holy temple, on the temple mount, in Jerusalem. And who comes there? Well, I think you already know the answer. On the one hand, as we read in Psalm 122, verse 2, our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Verse 4, where the tribes went up, even the tribes of God, as a testimony unto Israel, to give thanks unto the name of God. All the tribes, all of Israel, ascend to that place. But it's not just for the tribes of Israel. As we read in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of God's house shall be established as the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall stream unto it. And many peoples will go and say, go and let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. Note, on the one hand, everyone comes there. Everyone comes to God's house, to the holy temple, the threshing floor of Arnon, the Jebusite. But they don't come as all the same thing. They come, after all, as all nations, all of the different nations. You come together, but you come there. You stand up, but not apart. You count as an individual who's part of a greater whole. You need to be counted. You need to count, but not against or apart, but rather as part of that whole. And in the same vein, Isaiah chapter 56, also the aliens that join themselves to God to minister unto him and to love the name of God to be his servants. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house will be called the house of prayer for all peoples. Again, all peoples, not merely all people as one amorphous mass, all peoples, everyone unique, everyone distinct, but as part of that greater whole. Because the real message of the census is, it's not just because God empowers us and tells us to do it. It's because God empowers us to make us count, to not only not be immature, irresponsible children, to also not merely be anonymous members of a big herd, to shoulder the responsibility of being unique as part of that greater scheme.
to be able to by standing up to be counted to really count in God's world because ultimately that's the greatest gift not only the greatest gift for all people in general that's the greatest gift for each and every human being as an individual that you have a unique role you have a unique destiny you were put here in this world for a purpose and so standing up to be counted is a critical means to being able to get the blessing for which you were put into this world on this note we conclude with one final observation going back to our starting point numbers chapter 1 verse 3 God's command to Moses, you shall number them by their hosts, even you and Aaron. Imagine this, please. You're being counted. You're being counted standing there. Not merely as part of an anonymous mass of people, not as part of a herd. You're standing there before Moses and Aaron. They see you as an individual. They bless you as an individual with the blessing they are given by God for you as a unique individual. When you stand up to be counted, you make yourself worthy of being that channel, that conduit to receive God's blessing. Now again, that's not simply a gift without strings attached. It's an opportunity. And since it's an opportunity, it is inevitably also a responsibility. It is the opportunity to stand up and be counted as an individual. It is a responsibility that when you stand up to be counted as an individual, you have a unique role to play. Make sure you play it. Make sure you shoulder that responsibility. Don't stand up simply in order to stand out. Don't stand up in order to stand apart. On the contrary, stand up to be a part, a unique part of that greater whole. To be able to receive God's blessings, to be able to, even when coming together with all peoples, to that focal point, to God's holy temple. To recognize that you are an individual among all those peoples. Just as each people is a distinctive, unique people as part of all those peoples. That ultimately, the message that God is conveying to us contains within it this tension. If you ask, are we supposed to be individuals? or part of the generality of people? The answer inevitably is both. If we are merely part of the herd, we have not earned the blessings that come of being an individual. But if we just stand out for the sake of standing out, we don't warrant or deserve or receive the blessings either. May we always have the wisdom to learn this message. To take the opportunity and shoulder the responsibility to be able to by standing up to be counted as part of that whole become worthy of receiving god's blessings god bless you